Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome uh, to this uh, panel on introducing a new uh, database of investment treaties. My name is Rodrigo Polanco. Um, I work at the World Trade Institute, like it's you can read there. Um, and today we're going to uh, present you um, formally a database that has been several years in the making. Actually, it's going to be very soon uh, five years. Um, the name of the database is EDIT. It's the Electronic Database of Investment Treaties. And the purpose of this session is uh, to show you how this database is actually uh, working now in a dedicated website, but also to show you uh, what is different from this database that you can actually uh, use to do different type of research that the ones we are used to in the field of investment law. And for that, we are very, very, very lucky to have a, a group of researchers from all over the world that they have tested the, the very previous phases of this uh, of database. So it was when it was even a lot more difficult to use than now. So we are very thankful that you were our little bit of our guinea pigs and helping us testing this database. And also um, we will have before that the, the presentation of, uh, by one of the responsibles of this database uh, together with uh, myself and Manfred Elsig, that is Professor Wolfgang uh, Alschner. So um, before introducing you uh, the, the speakers, uh, let me show you where you can get this database. So if you just uh, go to internet and I don't know if you can see my screen yet. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Huh? Okay. Now we should be able to see it. Yes. So if you just write edit.wgi.org, you will end up in this web page. Okay. The, the web page also explains you that this project is basically the product of a SNES project that it was started in the year 2015 until 2017. And it has been uh, developed uh, by the World Trade Institute in close cooperation with the University of Ottawa and the World Bank. And we have had in the, the years that this project has been working, the help of a number of people uh, from research students, both in Bern and in Ottawa, and to a, a, a big team of people from all over the world. You can read some names there from, from the US, from the World Trade Organization, from the University of Zurich, um, from the European University of St. Petersburg and collaborators and researchers from all over the world, Kuwait, Palestine, Vietnam, Ecuador, Italy, and so on. So, why, why we wanted to make uh, a new database on investment treaties? Um, well, when, after doing some research uh, for several years in, in, in investment uh, treaty, treaty law, we noticed that there were three main problems with existing databases. One, it was that there were not all the treaties that they were supposed to be uh, available for the public. So there were some missing investment treaties that they were notified as existing, but nobody could get a hold of their text. The second problem we noticed is that many of these treaties, uh, they, were, they were not in a language that uh, everybody could easily understand. So even though the large majority of the treaties, they are in English, uh, several treaties, they are only in the language and official language of, of one of the contracting parties, uh, that it could be French, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Arabic, German, and so on and even some more exotic languages. The problem is that uh, we noticed that the research that it was done up to this point uh, basically relied heavily on the English uh, treaties, the treaties that would text was only in English, leaving aside an important uh, uh, group of treaties in other languages. And the third uh, issue we noticed when we started with this project is that um, the text of the treaties was available in different shapes and, and sizes. So basically, the, some there were scanners of, of, of old uh, photocopies or PDFs, some there were digital texts, but the large majority of them, they were very difficult actually to, uh, to work with them using, using machine reading. So you had to do manual research on them and you couldn't use computational uh, tools 
that would allow you to actually to speed up the process to understand the the the, the different notions and, and provisions that you find in these agreements. So with this in mind, we, we created this database that, as I mentioned before, is a database that has uh, more treaties than the ones that are usually available in other databases. That we have all the treaties in one single language, so all the treaties are in English, and all the treaties, they are in a format that it, you, can, you can use them in, in um, for for machine uh, for machine uh, purposes, so you can work with them as as they were digital text. So I I, will, I invite you to go to the to the to the web page and to uh, examine how this this database work. Uh, we are still testing several features, so uh, we would truly appreciate your feedback. The the web page actually works on a, on a wiki model, so you can actually leave your comments, you can actually make some changes and the, the, those changes that will be accepted by the administrators. Um, just to show you some, some stuff, for example, if you want to check, look for countries, uh, you want to check for treaties from Albania, and they will come all the treaties, both the BITs, but also the treaties that Albania has signed, that they are treaties with investment provisions. You can access the, the text of the treaty, you can also um, uh, download the PDF of the agreement. So it's automatically created. And you can also download the XML version of the, the treaty. Um, there are a number of filters here that should make your life easy, or easier at least. Um, you've gone, for example, if you want to uh, find the treaties that the country grouping has signed, uh, the Belgium Luxembourg Economic Union, and uh, you will find 105 treaties. But if you want to specifically find the ones that they concluded with one country, for example, Albania, you just click here and you have that specific treaty. And I don't want to bore you with this much longer, but you can filter by type of treaty, you can filter by country categories, you can uh, filter depending if the treaty is, the text is available or not available. You can filter by the document status, if it's signed in force, if it's terminated by date. And also you can uh, filter by categories. This is a, it's a, it's a function that uh, is uh, very similar to the, to the, the mapping that has been done in other web, websites. Um, but the big difference is that here, the, the treaties as that they can be there in an XML format, they have been annotated um, using the machine. No, so we use certain keywords, we use the article headers, and we have uh, annotated these treaties automatically. So you could find, for example, if you want to check for umbrella clauses. Right. And of course now is, yes. So then you have the treaties where, uh, where umbrella clauses are available. And if you want to, then you need to refresh if you want to look again. And if you want for, for example, check for expropriation, then you have all the treaties they have automa automatically uh, a provision on expropriation and so on. The, the beauty of this, and, and with this I stop my, my short introduction, is that uh, if you want to create a new, uh, a new filter, a new category that it was not uh, examined before, you just need to add the keywords. And, and actually uh, the machine will re-index re the whole database and you will actually create a new category. Uh, that's the difference of doing this by hand. If you, if you do a mapping, then you need to go back and read all the treaties and to mark one by one, uh, which uh, include these new categories. So um, it actually opens a lot of opportunities for making the research a lot easier in investment law not only for lawyers, but also for, for economists and political scientists that they want to see these documents more as data 
and, uh, and to be able to extract, extract a lot of information from them. So um, without further ado, I will leave the floor now to our first speaker, Professor Wolfgang Ausner from the University of Ottawa. As you probably know, Wolfgang is an empirical legal scholar specialized in international economic law and the computational analysis of law. He is a permanent faculty member of the Common Law Section of the University of Ottawa with a cross appointment to the Faculty of Engineering, School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He is also a faculty member of the Center for Law, Technology and Society of the University of Ottawa and heads the EU Ottawa Legal Technology Lab. So if you want to, to learn more about uh, legal tech for lawyers, Wolfgang is the go-to person. Uh, Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Rodrigo. And before I start with uh, some research applications of edit, I just would like to reiterate what Rodrigo has said, that this has been a project that has been very long in the making. Five years we've been working on this with many helpers and collaborators across the world. But I would be amiss if I didn't single out Rodrigo for his leadership and his dedication to this project. I think no one has cleaned more documents and helped to correct more OCR errors than, than Rodrigo. So we are deeply grateful for your commitment. Uh, now, let me share my screen and uh, point you to some of the research applications that we uh, envisage could be possible through edits. Uh, do you see my screen? My PowerPoint, yes. Right, so uh, uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, we just want to showcase a couple of things that we highlight in our introductory paper that I will point you towards the end. So as Rodrigo has said in his, in his introductory remarks, there is a reason why we built this database. And uh, Rodrigo already pointed to some of the features that are somewhat unique to edit. What I would like to highlight here is that these unique features, they correspond to biases in existing databases that then led to biases in research. So Rodrigo mentioned that existing databases often focus on specific regions or leave out specific regions. So they are missing investment treaties that systematically obscure the treaty practice of several continents, such as the Middle East and, and Africa. And so EDIT, by engaging in this in-depth hunt for treaties, is trying to mitigate this selection bias. The second aspect that Rodrigo pointed to is the language issue. So a, a lot of bits and uh, some free trade agreements are exclusively written in non-English languages uh, which means that most scholars that study only English treaties will miss their content. And so what we have tried to do by harmonizing uh, every agreement and translating it into, into English, we've actually tried to correct an English language bias that exists in research where only original English texts are being looked at. The third issue that Rodrigo highlighted is that many of the databases, not all of them, we have some excellent uh, public uh, uh, source documents, open access document, uh, uh, databases, but some databases that are very good for search and analysis, they are only accessible to subscribers. So edit is trying to make this more accessible to everyone who's doing research. And finally, and that's really a key issue that I will emphasize today in particular, is that existing databases, they are great for human inspection of treaties. So we can look for an individual treaty, a, a lawyer can read that, that treaty, or look for specific features in that agreement. What we cannot do with existing databases is to look at all the treaties using non-traditional methods, such as text analysis. And again, this is something that EDIT is trying to remedy. EDIT is trying to fill this gap that is left by existing investment treaty databases. I would like to highlight today two research illustrations that we outline in our introductory paper. One relates to the question, is there a global model, a global similarity across most of the investment treaties that exist? And second, I want to revisit an old debate uh, concerning rule takers and rule makers. Let me do this step by step. So for those who may not be as familiar as others with the investment literature, there is a twofold assumption when we approach the investment regime. On the one hand, scholars reiterate a point that has been made many times that this is a universe made up, uh, made up of thousands of individual treaties that are by themselves distinct. But at the same time, these same scholars also point to the fact that many of these treaties share similar traits. 
Of course, there's a little bit of a tension in between these two. To what extent are treaties more similar to each other? Is there something like a, a global harmonized standard? Or do they err more on the side of diversity and distinctness? Now, what we are trying to do in our introductory paper is to provide one possible answer to that by looking at the similarity of the entire investment treaty universe. So what you see here on the, on the next slide is what is called a similarity heat map. So we've investigated the textual similarities. So we've compared the text tokens in 3,500, uh, 3,054 bilateral investment treaties. And in that heat map, those treaties that are more similar to each other, uh, they are color coded as red and those that are more dissimilar to each other are color coded as yellow. And the two axes that you have to imagine behind this heat map are all these 3,500 investment treaties. So this red diagonal line that runs through it is a comparison with, of every treaty with itself. And you already see a couple of interesting features that uh, previous research has already highlighted. National investment treaty programs tend to be relatively similar in and of itself. They seem to be internally consistent. So here we've just highlighted the, the French and BIT uh, the French and Dutch bit clusters that are these red quadrangles that indicate highly similar agreements. But the new finding that we introduce here is that there's actually a group, a relatively large group making up almost one third of the entire bilateral investment treaty universe that is much more similar than the rest of that universe. And what these treaties of uh, more similar design have in common is that they are all linked to the United Kingdom's treaty design. So the first treaty in that cluster is the UK Egypt bit signed in 1975. And then as more countries joined the investment treaty universe, they were inspired, they copied from that original treaty in order to shape their own investment treaty practice. And so what we've seen here then is maybe not a global bit model, but we've seen that a large part of the investment treaty universe actually dates back to very specific treaty design, and that is that of the United Kingdom. Just to make this a little bit more tangible, here you see expropriation provisions in three different treaties. The treaty I've just talked about, the Egypt-UK bit from 1975, and then just uh, uh, two other relatively randomly selected treaties just based on the considerations that they should, should have been later in time and signed by other, uh, other states. And you see the similarity is really striking. South uh, Korea uh, and Sri Lanka have copied the UK, Egypt bit, that provision almost word for word. Same goes for the Barbados, Venezuela bit. And these are not isolated instances. This is a commonality across bit cluster that I've showed you. Of course, some countries are more, I've copied more than others. But there is similarity that goes back to the United Kingdom treaty network more generally within that cluster. The other interesting thing that we have found, that goes back to something that Rodrigo and I have stressed earlier, this ability to investigate treaties across languages, is that we have found some treaties that we only had in non-English languages. So for instance, the Estonia-Lithuania bit. And so initially, uh, we were puzzled by that tr treaty because these are two neighboring countries, two Baltic states that share common history, that, uh, that share common traditions. So you would have perhaps thought that these two countries, when they come together and sign a bilateral investment treaty, they would opt for very unique and bespoke treaty design that fits their cultural heritage, their commonalities. But what we found actually is once we have translated that agreement is that it forms part of that larger cluster being inspired by the earlier United Kingdom, Egypt bilateral investment treaty. And actually it's not unique at all. Uh, here, I've just highlighted one comparison to the Albania Czech Republic bilateral investment treaty that is to 75% similar to the Estonia Lithuania bit. And here you see just one example, article four in these both, uh, in these two, two treaties that are really identical apart from, from two words. So, it opens up the possibility to provide a bird's eye view of the investment treaty universe and to find these patterns of commonalities that hitherto were just assumed or, or taken for granted. Let me then talk a little bit about a second research illustration that is about rule takers and rule makers. 
So for the last decade, there has been growing, uh, there have been growing insights about the underlying dynamic that shapes treaty design, at least to some extent. And that is a rule taker versus rule maker dynamic. The rule makers are normally capital exporting home states of investors and capital importing states are usually the rule takers. So they sign at the dotted line based on a template that has been provided by the richer capital exporting state. And Ellie and Pinot have uh, put this succinctly. The explanation for treaty design resides squarely with the preferences and power of home states. And others have found the same pattern that if we look at the relationship between a country's internal consistency in terms of its treaty network's internal similarity, which is a proxy for how successful a country has been in continuously signing the same type of agreement and relate that to GDP per capita, we see that there's a strong correlation between the two. But what we also see is that there is still some unexplained variation. And one of the things that we look at in our introductory paper is one of these groupings that are a little bit puzzling. So the Czech Republic and Poland, they have started to sign investment treaties around the same time. They're also relatively similar countries. As you can see here, they approximately have the same GDP per capita. Poland has a larger GDP. So if anything, you would expect Poland to be perhaps more of a rule maker than the Czech Republic. And so what we have done, we have then systematically looked at the treaties they have signed uh, with other states and specifically looked for treaties they have signed with the same host state and to see to what extent they are, they are similar or different. And the results are really striking. While the Czech Republic has been very successful in concluding very consistent bits, for instance, with Latvia, Romania, Vietnam, and Mongolia, this is a, a selection that we provide here, Poland has signed very dissimilar bits. So with respect to Latvia, it signed one treaty. With respect to Romania, it signed a very differently designed treaty as expressed by these very or relatively low similarity scores, especially if you compare it to uh, the 90% similarity that we see when the Czech Republic signs treaties. So for some reason, the Czech Republic in that universe is a rule maker. It comes with its template, with its preferences, and it gets its partner states such as Latvia, Romania, Vietnam, and Mongolia to basically sign at the dotted line, resulting in very consistent treaty practice. While Poland, a country supposedly even larger than the Czech Republic, has been less successful in implementing a consistent treaty practice. And uh, while we don't venture into explaining these types of patterns, what EDIT allows you to do is to spot them in the first place. And we hope that researchers in the future will then take up the baton and look at potential explanations or critique our, our uh, method. This is just an illustration of what we're doing in this introductory paper. I invite you to, to look at it yourself. We also look at other trends, for instance, mandatory versus hortatory language that you can track using edits or to look at specific provisions. We have illustrated this in our paper with respect to the uh, preambles that integrate different policy considerations as the investment treaty regime matures. So there are lots of research applications, both in international law and other fields such as political science and international uh, uh, economics. So hopefully this is a resource that will be used widely. I'm now very much looking forward to hearing from our other uh, collaborators on what they have been able to do with edit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfram. You really stick to the time. So I hope that this was uh, is, is a very good introduction of, of what this database is. Um, Without further ado now, I want to give the floor to Priyanka Kerr. Uh, Priyanka is a private sector specialist in the investment and competition unit of the World Bank Group's Macroeconomics, if is that still the name, because um, they, they, they have been changing names recently. Uh, trade and investment global practice. She focuses on analytical and global operational projects on policy, legal and regulatory reforms to enable countries to attract, retain and benefit from investment. Prior to joining the World Bank Group, she practiced law at uh, law firms in India and Singapore, advising companies on domestic and cross-border corporate and commercial transactions. She has published several papers on investment climate reform, mega regional trade and investment agreements. And one of these papers was precisely, I mean, exact two in fact, but one that is part of a bigger publication and one that, it, that uh, 
that uh, she co-authored and she's, it, it's available on the, on the webpage of the, this forum. Uh, we thank you very much, Priyanka, for, for, for your presentation and for being one of uh, the early testers of this database. The floor is yours. Thanks, Rodrigo. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here today. Um, let me quickly share my screen first, since I have a couple of slides I want to share. Do you see my screen, Rodrigo? All right. So for today's session, I thought I'll share with you two illustrations of fairly recent um, research applications of the IA database. One is essentially benchmarking countries along the level of investment protection based on the content of IAEs. And the second is creation of a whole new index in wherein the, the content of IAEs was a critical component. So the first project really is on investment protection along the Belt and Road. And this was part of a larger World Bank report from 2019 on, the, on Belt and Road economics. And the idea here was really comparing 21 of our sample countries um, in terms of quality of investor protection. We focused on overland corridors in this case. And, and the goal was really to come with broad indicative uh, areas of reform for these countries. What was measured was really the extent to which countries provide predictability to investors by limiting possibilities of arbitrary government interference. Now, how we did, was, uh, how we did this was essentially through a framework which comprised four analytical questions. So first, we looked at uh, you know, what is protected? What is, what is the kind of investment that's protected? So here we examined uh, whether tangible assets are included, intangible assets, in particular, keeping in mind the kind of investment that BRI was expected to get. So contractual rights, whether investment financed by debt was included, also whether investment made by SOEs was included. Second, we looked at what is it protected from? So direct and indirect expropriations, restrictions on arbitrary uh, ability to convert and transfer currency, currency, non-transparent and arbitrary government conduct, and of course, threat to physical security. Third, uh, if things go wrong, what is the kind of recourse available? So both state-state dispute settlement and investor state, as well as other mechanisms that might be available to address issues against public agencies. And last, uh, which was more a qualitative assessment, was the level of enforcement, level of enforcement of the existing laws and regulations of the countries, but also in case of an award, um, how effective is, that, uh, is the enforcement of an award in the country. But that was more this, I think the fourth pillar was more of a qualitative assessment. For the other three, what was essentially done was the content of IAs was broken down into minor, minor granular questions and then coded and then scored. And that's how, you know, following that, we essentially came up with a cumulative, cumulative country level score. Uh, so this was on the protection side. The, uh, in the research, we also covered uh, uh, what we called a balance score to really uh, gauge, you know, what was the level of flexibilities, exceptions, carve outs included uh, with respect to the right to regulate. So whether, for example, inclusion of an essential security exception or other explicit ex uh, exceptions on the main guarantees. Um, so in terms of our data sources, uh, for we all, we'd also included domestic investment laws for which we'd used UNCTAD, um, UNCTAD's Investment Policy Hub. And in IIAs, we essentially relied on, and thanks to uh, Rodrigo, we had uh, early access to the edit uh, database. Uh, this is quite some time back. Uh, so between uh, UNCTAD and um, edit, we covered about 716 IIAs. That's where these are the countries, so all our 21 sample countries. And overall, we managed to cover about 90% of the treaties between our sample countries. So it was quite, quite a, a sizable coverage. And most of these were signed between 95 and, and uh, 96, 1995 and 1996. So over the next few slides, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just run you through a couple of uh, examples of the kind of analysis we did, and also some examples of how data using the edit database or IA databases can be presented. So here, for example, this is more at a cumulative level uh, for our sample 21 BRI countries, uh, we have the blue bars essentially showing the level of investment protection and the dotted line, the balance score. What we're seeing is there's a peak in the, uh, you know, uh, the period when there were relatively unqualified standards, fewer exceptions that were included. Um, and then you, what you see post 2000s 
has a slight decline in the protection score, but a slight increase, a, a substantial increase in the balance score. Again, with the high profile you know, disputes from in the 2000s, a greater number of interpretational guidelines and exceptions being included. So overall, our observations on the sample BRI countries very much mirrored the global uh, IIA developments. In the next slide, we dug down or we zoomed in a one level below and went to country specific eyes. So here we um, just mentioning the eyes with China. Uh, on the first graph is really uh, looking into the broad components. So the scope in terms of what is protected, the standards of treatment, recourse and what exceptions were included. Um, and you'll see, so again, this is all of our sample countries and these broad components. So we see a fair bit of consistency uh, across the scope, you know, a wide set of assets were included, uh, debt was not excluded, but where we do see variation is on standards of treatment and recourse. And to give you an example, you know, Turkmenistan performs is sort of lower than most of the other countries on recourse, and that's largely because their uh, investment treaty didn't really include much on, uh, you know, have many provisions on dispute settlement. And then on the uh, graph right next to this one, we, we zoomed in one level further, which is going into the details of each of the components. So the second graph really looks into standards of treatment. And so here we are again comparing, benchmarking quantitatively all of our sample countries on uh, the standards of treatment covering fair and equitable treatment, umbrella clauses, expropriation, and transfers provisions. And again, we see a you know, fair bit of consistency on expropriation, except for I see you know, Pakistan performing relatively weaker, and that's because they didn't include a reference to adequacy of compensation in case of expropriation. So you could really go into this level of detail and pinpoint you know, specific areas of reform that, that countries can, can consider. Uh, while you know, uh, in terms of the other standards, I think there's a fair bit of variation. Here, this slide presents really investor protection uh, for specific treaties, but a similar analysis could also, was also done for the balance provisions and the exceptions. Uh, this is, uh, my next slide is really another illustration of data presentation. Since the project and our overall report was on the on Belt, Belt and Road Economics, the BRI, uh, obviously a lot of the focus was on the corridors. Um, corridors, you know, uh, typically have three to four countries. So obviously that amplifies risks for investors in terms of navigating multiple rules and regulations and institutions. So here what we tried to do was really showcase uh, how the level of risk for investors varies across the corridor, uh, higher protection, medium protection, and low protection. So it's an illustration of you know, the kind of presentations you could have for data, uh, uh, for IA data using some of the, you know, using this uh, database. And then uh, finally on this research project, we ultimately came up with a typology of countries. This was based on the kind of BRI investment um, profile of a country as well as protection profile. So what you see here is we came up with essentially, we, we observed rather two categories of countries. There's those countries which stand to gain substantially from the BRI initiative in terms of higher added land value as a percentage of GDP, and that are also, uh, the, but which have relatively low levels of investor protection in IAs. And these would be countries such as Laos, Cambodia, uh, some legal reforms. On the other hand, you have countries that stand to benefit from the BRI initiative, but also have high levels of protection. Uh, and these are mostly the Central Asian countries. And here what we saw, uh, a lot of the Central Asian countries, and what we saw here was, you know, despite really good de jure rules, uh, a lot of the challenges were really on enforcement. So here kind of our, our broad uh, uh, impression was these countries could perhaps benefit from, you know, strengthening the level of enforcement uh, uh, in these countries. So that's really some of the analysis on uh, the first research project on uh, I wanted to share with you, which is on the BRI. Um, and then the second example is an example on regulatory risk and FDI. This was part of the uh, recent report, Global Investment Competitiveness Report 2019-20. Um, and uh, the background for this research is that we had, we had seen that you know, there are several political risk ratings, several country risk ratings, but most of those ratings are really mapped to investor perceptions. So in terms of countries identifying specific areas of reform, they weren't always very helpful. So the idea was to develop a, a, an index which is mapped to specific legal and regulatory provisions and features uh, so that countries are able to detect and identify specific reforms that they can undertake to minimize uh, regulatory risk. So that was sort of the overall goal to, to really come up with an actionable 
index. And again, here our framework was uh, essentially based on three analytical pillars. Um, first, uh, we looked into, um, first, we looked into transparency. So here we examined, is there transparency regarding the content of the law as well as the process of making laws? Um, and in the, under this, you know, we looked at whether there is systematic publication and consultation on laws and regulations. Are there registries or platforms, similar mechanisms to allow investors to find information? And lastly, but very importantly, specificity and clarity of legal provisions, you know, in terms of timelines, requirements, are all of those stipulated in the, in the legal instrument itself? Second pillar was protection. Here we looked at what is the extent of legal protection uh, to investors against arbitrary, unpredictable, or non-transparent government actions. So we focused on absolute uh, standards of treatment, looked into fair, fair and equitable treatment, expropriation, and the transfers provision. And lastly, again, if things were to go wrong, uh, you know, what's the quality of dispute settlement provisions? But very importantly, uh, something uh, we've been working a lot on, on dispute prevention mechanisms as well. So that was really our framework. And again, we took the content of IIA, split it down uh, into you know, uh, multiple questions coded and scored. But uh, I think the important point here is while IIA content fed into the index uh, substantially, there were several other data sources which ultimately came together to, to create this measure. Uh, the measure covers, has two versions. Uh, one is a, a panel version from 2014 to 17, which with greater country coverage, but fewer data sources. And the second one which has 86 countries, uh, but you know, with a larger set of uh, a larger amount of data included in it. So that really is uh, this new measure, uh, you know, that we've uh, kind of written about in the global investment competitiveness uh, report from this year. Um, the, the next few slides are just some of our key results. So we explored using the regulatory risk measure. Um, you know, can, can it be, can it explain some of the perceptions of investment risk? And in, indeed, we did see correlations between risk ratings and risk premiums and the, uh, and the regulatory risk measure. Uh, the, the next uh, result I wanted to quickly share with you is uh, regulatory risk and FDI inflows. So whether at a country level, we can say, is it predictive of, you know, the uh, FDI inflows and uh, FDI decisions? And we saw that lower levels of regulatory risk indeed um, could uh, lead to you know higher higher FDI flows and and uh, an important result which uh, for the sake of brevity we hadn't included a graph uh, or a figure on was we was we also looked at uh, investor specific uh, data so investor level data and what we did find was that regulatory risk deters entry and expansion and so our final result was an average reduction by one percent in regulatory risk increases the likelihood of investors entering or expanding by about 0 0.5 to 2 percentage points. So that was really another related result, but based on investor level data and not country level data. And finally, this is my last slide. Um, in terms of policy conclusions, you know, we saw that the measure is, is indicative of risk perception, um, is associated with lower investor, investor entry and expansion, and then different elements of the regulatory framework matter. It's not just the de jure, but also the transparency uh, uh, in the content as well as making of regulations. And to give you an example, specific action items, improving transparency, more precision and drafting of legal provisions, and taking the example of the recourse pillar, a wide range, range of dispute settlement mechanisms, but also very importantly, dispute prevention mechanisms. So this is to give you a very quick uh, overview of our two research, uh, recent research projects, but uh, we are very excited and look forward to exploring much more using uh, the database. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Priyanka. Um, it was a really a very interesting presentation, and I think it highlights uh, the possibility of having uh, the, the, the data we have in edit uh, interacting also with other databases that, that they will be created or, or, or that you are creating actually uh, using the data that you find in edit. Um, let's move now to our next uh, presenter. Our next presenter is uh, uh, more Link from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, she's uh, doing her, her uh, PhD uh, yeah, there, um, your second year, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and she will uh, uh, make a presentation on uh, a very interesting research using uh, edit, uh, basic on, on uh, Islamic uh, jurisdiction uh, treaties. Uh, yeah. One moment. Okay, thanks Rodrigo and thanks uh, for inviting me to talk here. I'm very happy to be here today. 
Uh, so just one quick word about the database before I jump into the research. Uh, I think the database has so many advantages and I think that everyone uh, who's interested in researching the global investment regime would benefit a lot from it. Uh, I know I personally uh, did. It really helped my research, mine and Yoram's, uh, Yoram Haftel's research by making treaty texts uh, available, uh, particularly of countries in the Middle East and in North Africa, the area that I'm focusing on uh, in my uh, research. Uh, which is understudied in IP research in general and in uh, and the research on the global investment regime uh, in particular. Uh, so I'll take the next 15 minutes to present a paper I co-authored with Joran Haftel uh, in which some of the data was obtained through edits and they generously uh, shared the uh, treaties with us even before the database uh, was operational. And after that, I'll, I'll briefly sketch out a few ways uh, in which I expect edit to help my uh, uh, research in the future. So the paper, uh, which was published late last year, uh, examines what are the implications of domestic legal traditions for international cooperation. And more specifically, uh, we uh, examined whether IIAs concluded by Islamic law states are more or less legalized, uh, concentrating on foreign choice in investor state uh, dispute settlement provisions, ISDS provisions. And the main argument, <coughs> sorry, uh, is that treaties concluded by Islamic states are indeed less legalized when it comes to foreign choice. Uh, okay. So uh, ICS provisions, as we know, have real life implications. They're not just on paper devices. Uh, they gave rise to over 1,000 known cases of investment arbitration so far, involving many millions, sometimes even billions of dollars. And here I've gathered just a few uh, recent examples from the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, however, these uh, provisions are not uniform. They, they are different in their rules and in the forms to which uh, parties can turn to. And so there's a growing body of literature which examines the design of these provisions, but it has yet to examine the possible effect of the Islamic legal traditions. Now, the idea that states' domestic characteristics affect their international conduct is certainly not new. It's been thoroughly explored by many scholars. And recent studies have begun to consider one specific such factor uh, influencing states' behavior, and that's domestic law. And these studies argue that domestic law and international law are inextricably linked, uh, as a state's legal tradition shifts its attitude towards international law. So the notion that domestic legal traditions affect states' domestic and foreign policy in various sub-issues is not new. However, uh, most research uh, tends to focus on civil and common law, the two most prevalent legal traditions, and overlooks the, the Islamic legal uh, tradition, which is prevalent in about 10% of countries worldwide. Here you can see them uh, marked, marked in green in the map. And uh, more recent studies have begun to examine the effect of the Islamic legal tradition on the resolution of territorial disputes on international trade and commitment to international courts and treaties. And these studies didn't, uh, so far they overlooked the effect of the Islamic legal tradition on investment treaties. And so we took up that challenge to examine uh, how the Islamic legal tradition affects the design of ISDS provisions. Our theoretical framework relies on the notion that states externalize their legal tradition. And so I'll very briefly introduce some key characteristics uh, of the Islamic legal tradition and then explain how they might be demonstrated in ISDS position, uh, provisions. So legal traditions are, of course, distinct in many various aspects, and that includes their degree of formalism. Uh, the Islamic legal tradition is considered to be the least formal legal tradition compared with the two other major uh, traditions. And this tendency is manifested in the way uh, legal procedures are carried out, and prominently so in dispute settlement, reflecting a preference for a more flexible, more informal process as opposed to more formal Western procedures. And central to this preference is the concept of conciliation, or in Arabic, sulh. And this con concept, which is emphasized in Islam's primary sources, can be defined as settlement grounded upon compromise, negotiated by the disputants themselves, and that's important, or with the help of a third party. And now, as part of the process of dispute settlement, the preferred conciliator or arbitrator is an unbiased insider who maintains good relations with both parties. And this can be contrasted with the ideal arbitrator in Western approaches, who is often portrayed as a neutral, unaffiliated outsider. And so the Islamic legal tradition prefer, uh, uh, displays a preference for more informal venues for dispute settlement. But how might this uh, manifest in ISDS provisions? 
Well, a useful way to consider the difference between the various mechanisms for investment arbitration is through the concept of legal delegation, uh, which Abbott et al. define as the extent to which actors delegate authority to third party to implement, interpret, and, and apply rules, and of course, to settle disputes. And legal delegation in ICS can be thought of as a continuum. We have domestic courts on one end of this continuum, which represent the least legalized option, as states uh, do not delegate power to international uh, arbitration bodies. And in the other extreme, we have ICSID, which is the most prominent body to take on uh, investment arbitration, which represents the highest degree of legal delegation uh, due to its organizational structure and procedural rules. And given the Islamic legal tradition's lesser degree of formality, we expect that Islamic law states will refrain from including ICSID in their treaties, especially as an exclusive arbitration option. And so our first hypothesis for the paper was that Islamic law states will be less likely to rely on ICSID as a form for investment arbitration compared to states with other legal traditions. However, ICSID is certainly not the only uh, arbitration forum included uh, in treaties. Uh, in recent years, there's been a, a gradual increase in the number of international arbitration institutions uh, established outside of Europe, outside of North America, including in Muslim countries. And the reason for this, at least in part, uh, is fear of cultural bias uh, by Western dominated institutions. And the most frequently referred to mechanisms in treaties signed by uh, Muslim signatories that we found were the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration, uh, the Arab Investment Court and the Unified Agreement for Investment of Arab Capital in the Arab States, which contains provisions for dispute settlement. Uh, these mechanisms all share certain commonalities which render them more appealing for Islamic law states. First of all, their composition. They are established by Muslims and or for Muslims and most of their personnel serving as arbitrators or judges are Muslim, Muslims. And secondly, uh, their procedures, at least to a certain extent, render parties more flexibility as reflected in their procedural rules. And so our second hypothesis was that Islamic law states would be more likely to refer to Islamic arbitration forums um, and frameworks compared to states with other legal traditions. Now, before moving on to the research design, just a quick word about uh, arbitration forums in other non-Western regions. Because interestingly, we could, you couldn't find any evidence that developing countries in other regions of the world have adopted similar approaches vis-a-vis uh, -vis investment disputes. Despite the proliferation of arbitration centers and adjudication mechanisms in the developing world, and despite the fact that other non-Western regions have also had negative experience with international arbitration, and I'm thinking obviously about Latin America among other regions, uh, we were hard pressed to find uh, any IAAs with a reference uh, to forums located in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, East Asia, uh, or Eastern Europe. So moving on to the research design, uh, we, uh, our sample included over uh, 2,600 IAAs obtained from UNCTAD as well as EDIT. Um, and they were generous to let us use them before the database was made available. And we relied on UNCTAD's mapping project uh, of uh, IIA content and added uh, to their own coding, uh, coding that was uh, specifically designed for our research. Uh, we have two dependent variables. First of them is ICSID legalization, ranging between zero if uh, there was no mention of ICSID as an arbitration forum in the IIA, and three if ICSID was listed as the only available option for uh, ISDS. And the second variable is Islamic forums. And an Islamic uh, forum is defined as any arbitration body located in an Islamic uh, country or an agreement uh, among Islamic countries. The independent variable was pairs of uh, Islamic law countries. Uh, the variable was coded based on an examination of states' uh, official legal systems and the degree to which they were based on the Quran. We controlled for other major legal traditions as well as other attributes of Islamic countries. Now, Islamic states obviously share many other characteristics beyond their legal tradition, uh, which might also influence their approach to international law and dispute resolution. Uh, ruling these alternative explanations is challenging, but as a first cut, uh, we considered three other variables uh, that capture uh, shared Islamic traits, and these are Muslim majority, and membership in OPEC and membership in the Organization for uh, Islamic Cooperation. And, and of course, we uh, also control for a battery of other uh, variables. Uh, before moving to the results, I'll have just a quick look at some descriptive statistics. So we can see that Islamic law, uh, Islamic law diets refer less to ICSID in each and every category. Uh, 
Uh, for example, around 25% of Islamic law uh, diet do not include ICSID as an option at all in their uh, uh, ICS provisions, compared with almost 10% of non-Islamic uh, diets. And regarding the Islamic forums, here we can see that uh, 41 percent of Islamic law diets include an Islamic forum in the ISDS provisions, compared with the measly one percent of non-Islamic law diets. Moving on to the results, so overall the results provide strong support for this theoretical framework. We can see that uh, Islamic law states, uh, Islamic law diets result in lower legalization of international investment arbitration. Uh, note that statistically significant results are marked with an arrow indicating whether they are positive or negative. So regarding the first, uh, uh, the first variable, ICSID legalization, uh, Islamic law diet is negative and statistically significant in all models, uh, while other Islamic related attributes were not statistically significant. And importantly, the effect of Islamic legal tradition was also found to be substantially meaningful as Islamic law diets are about 30% less likely to adopt ICSID as an exclusive arbitration forum compared to other diets. And moving on to the second variable, Islamic forums, here we can see that all Islamic related variables are positive and highly uh, statistically significant. Uh, however, uh, the effect of, the, of legal tradition on Islamic forum is statistically as well as substantially stronger than uh, the other Islamic related factors. Most notably, the substantive effect of the other variables is at most only half that of Islamic law diets. Uh, so to conclude the, uh, my speech on this, on this paper, uh, the Islamic legal tradition's preference for less formal mechanism for dispute uh, resolution results in lower legalization of international investment arbitration. Uh, Islamic law diets are less likely to adopt ICSID, the most legalized ISDS option, uh, as an exclusive arbitration forum compared to other pairs of states. And the results also show us that Islamic law diets are more likely to include Islamic arbitration forums in their ISDS provisions. And so the research gives further insight on the determinants of the variation in IAAs and of ISDS uh, provisions in particular. Uh, and it sheds light on prominent arbitration forums outside of Europe and North America uh, with a special focus on the frequently overlooked Islamic world. And as developing countries become more and more economically influential, we think it's important to better understand their preferences while keeping in mind that this group of states is by no means monolithic. And this last point, uh, I just, yes. uh, this last point stresses for me the importance and usefulness of the edit uh, database because the database provides uh, easy access to many texts that were not uh, available previously, importantly of treaties from understudied regions uh, and of non-English uh, treaties. And there are several ways in which I think this important enterprise will help me uh, in my future research, my near, my near future research and my dissertation, uh, mainly to systematically and more efficiently examine uh, IAAs inside MENA. Uh, to see trends of uh, rule makers and rule takers, uh, trends of overlap in the universe of uh, uh, IIAs in uh, the MENA region. And I plan to do this both in English and in Arabic texts. And to examine a uh, vertical diffusion of legal commitments in MENA um, by looking at IIAs in MENA as well as domestic legislation on investment. And in both these projects, I expect uh, edit to be very useful. So thanks for listening and looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mor. It was a really a very, very nice presentation, very clear. Uh, just, I mean, uh, I, I was, when you were mentioning that how uh, this kind of, of, of um, phenomenon that you detected in, in Islamic jurisdiction doesn't happen elsewhere, I, I, immediately I was thinking of Latin America. We have been discussing for, I don't know, more than 20 years, depending on how you start counting, on the creation of a regional uh, arbitration center for investment disputes and, and it's, uh, it's going nowhere. So it's really, really interesting, uh, the conclusions you came up uh, with. So moving on our panel, last but not least, let me introduce you, uh, Professor Anne-Marie uh, Thao from uh, the University of Sydney. Uh, and Marie, a researcher, uses a theory of public policy making to explore facilitators and barriers to best practice public health nutrition policy with a particular focus on the interface between economic policy and nutrition. And, uh, um, and Marie is actually Associate Professor for Public Policy and Health 
at the University of Sydney. And we are very lucky also to have her as one of our early beta testers of this uh, database. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the introduction and also the invitation to present. Um, as you mentioned, my interest is um, slightly different to many others. It seems in terms of coming very much from a public health perspective, I work within a school of public health. Um, but my training is in political science and um, as Rodrigo mentioned, I was very delighted to be one of the guinea pigs working with the EDIT database and having the opportunity to collaborate uh, with Wolfgang, as well as my colleague, Faisal Syed, who is uh, one of the participants today. Um, so my interest in international investment treaties really comes from um, my economic training, recognising that international investment agreements really are perform a very legitimate economic policy function. But one of the challenges from a public health perspective is that they've been used by industry actors to dispute health policy measures, legitimate health policy measures in critical public health areas such as tobacco control and access to medicine. So the World Health Organization has made some quite strong recommendations that countries consider health safeguards or health protections within the text of their treaties. But there's been quite inconsistent adoption and there hasn't been any systematic analysis of what these safeguards might look like and the way in which they could be, their adoption could be encouraged. So as an illustration, in 2012, Philip Morris Asia um, contested Australia's tobacco plain packaging legislation, which is one of the World Health Organization's recommended approaches to reducing tobacco consumption. For those not working in public health, tobacco kills half of all people who use it as intended, and is thus a really significant public health concern. Um, so for Australia to find themselves in the middle of an investor state dispute settlement um, dispute, uh, investor state dispute, sorry, under the ISDS mechanism within the Hong Kong Australia Bilateral Investment Treaty was really quite concerning from a public health perspective and highlighted for a lot of people um, the importance of considering what safeguards might look like in this particular context. Ultimately, Australia was um, successful, but you can see here that there was what is in at least public health terms, a significant cost to defending this legitimate regulation. And in addition, there's evidence that it contributed to regulatory chill in terms of uh, creating hesitation amongst some other countries to adopt best practice tobacco um, policy measures. So in this study, um, we use the electronic database of investment treaties to look at health inclusions and to try to understand um, not only what those safeguards might look like, because of course EDIT has full text of the agreements, but also to understand who's implementing them. And we used a framework based very much on um, Julia Black's Diffusion of Regulatory Innovation Framework that, pulled, um, that looked very much at what the nature of this innovation is, who's innovating, and whether we can see any evident diffusion networks. Uh, this piece of work is ongoing, it's not published yet, so I'm presenting preliminary findings here in this, in this presentation. We received two sets of data from EDIT, this was before it was made publicly available. So one was all of um, the metadata on existing BITs, including the number of mentions of health in the treaty based on keyword search. The second data set we received was the um, clauses that surrounded the keyword health in each of these um, in each of these treaties. And so our first step was then to uh, clean particularly data set two in terms of reviewing all of the mentions of health and assessing whether they were of public health relevance. So for example, some of these mentions were simply a reference to an article name that included health and it wasn't actually anything that could be considered a health safeguard or health protection. 
Our focus here was um, both qualitative and quantitative in terms of analysis. Our first step was to develop a set of new variables to complement data set one. So one of these was to quantify um, some of the qualitative data, which was in our second data set. The other was to draw on um, external sources of data that related to our framework. So for example, um, identifying regional groupings, uh, regional economic bodies and regional health bodies that different countries with um, were part of and to be able to um, also translate some of the broader data from the, um, the qualitative data set too into numeric forms such as um, how, how many um, mentions of health appeared in each in each investment treaty. So with our analysis, we focused uh, first on the quantitative assessment uh, to understand where what innovation was occurring. So which articles the mentions of health occurred in and which countries had signed BITs that included uh, mentions of health. So my colleague Faisal conducted these using both Microsoft Excel and also Python. Uh, in collaboration with a colleague in the engineering department at the University of Sydney, Dr. Arden. Our qualitative analyses were informed um, by a legal analysis approach and uh, Wolfgang provided some advice on this to understand some of the textual variations in the health clauses within each of the articles. And I'm going to present our preliminary findings related to the preamble, the expropriation chapter and the general exception chapter. Um, so overall, one of the interesting findings was that um, there was really significant health inclusions early on in the BIT universe in the um, 1960s and 70s in particular. It was quite common for investment treaties to include mentions of health and um, recognition that health objectives of governments were quite important. This really dropped away during the 1970s and 80s and during the period, I guess, around the Washington consensus and um, increasing globalization and agreements where we see significant increase in um, the number of investment treaties being signed, we actually see a really low proportion of those including any mention or recognition of health. This contrasts significantly with the more recent period where um, health inclusions have become more common. Now we see that about 50% of recent agreements, take, keeping in mind that there are pr progressively fewer agreements being signed, 50% of those agreements are including mention of health. So it's quite an interesting trend. And one thing that we observed from a public health perspective was that um, from the early 2000s, the World Health Organization as the main UN body with responsibility for public health was um, having a, I guess, making significant commentary about the importance of recognizing health as really pivotal to development and economic development. And of course, the World Bank was also making quite similar statements. So I think generally, there was uh, quite a bit of recognition of the importance of health. Um, and also, I think it perhaps an increasing dialogue at the global level between health and economic bodies. Um, when we look at health inclusions in um, international investment agreements by country, uh, or in uh, BITs, sorry, I've got that title wrong, um, by country and also we looked at uh, World Health Organization regional groupings, which was our interest from a public health perspective we could see that um, the European region really is leading to date in health inclusions. Um, but that there is really, this is quite a global phenomenon and didn't seem to be isolated to any particular region. Um, you can see that Germany has signed the most bits that include mention of health. Um, but proportionally, Canada and Mauritius have actually signed, they have a higher proportion of bits that include mention of health. Uh, when we look at, specifically at these three um, chapters, we, we chose them really um, partly as exploratory studies, but also because we think they potentially have relevance. 
So health inclusions in the preamble have really been um, have been increasing significantly since 2001. They were quite reasonably rare early on and have been increasing. And even though these clauses aren't legally binding, um, they, sorry, um, even though these clauses aren't legally binding, they do provide a reference point in terms of setting out the objectives of the agreement and also potentially for the objectives of that agreement being interpreted with consideration of health. So these um, inclusions in the preamble included comments are uh, the strongest one that, or potentially one of the stronger ones that we noticed was on the right to regulate. So it would state something like, um, recognizing the right of parties to regulate investments in their respective territories to achieve legitimate public policy objectives, including health. So this type of statement from a public health perspective sets health objectives as legitimate in the context of interpreting the investment agreement as a whole. We also examined the mentions of health that appeared in the expropriation chapter. This is quite a new inclusion and appears only in 77 bits. So this was quite interesting, particularly um, considering the fact that the Philip Morris dispute, for example, um, was in part on the basis of indirect expropriation because of the implications of the new legislation the government of Australia was introducing for um, the viability of the enterprise in Australia. So basically that it would be an effective measure that would reduce sales of tobacco, but thus reduce the value of the investment that Philip Morris Asia had in Philip Morris Australia. Um, so it's quite interesting to see um, the reasonably limited use of exceptions specific to expropriation, although it's also worth noting that the tribunal rejected Philip Morris's claim um, that it constituted, um, well, they rejected the claim on the basis that Philip Morris Asia had acquired Philip Morris Australia solely to dispute Australia's plain packaging. So it's kind of, it, there wasn't really a specific decision to my knowledge on whether that indirect expropriation claim uh, was, was correct. But it's interesting to see there's very limited use because this claim of indirect expropriation is one that's often discussed from a, from a health perspective. And we also, um, it, it does seem like, it does seem potentially likely that the increasing use and proportionally in recent years, this has increased quite substantially given the number of agreements that have been signed, may be a response to the contestation of health measures as indirect expropriation. Um, finally, we looked at health in the general exceptions chapter. Um, we found this was um, surprisingly uncommon, actually. It's been widely recommended, um, in, part due to, as, in part as a reflection of the general exception that's made in GATT Article 20. Um, in trade agreements, it's been quite common to include general exceptions that relate to health. So we were surprised to see how little it appeared in the scheme of the uh, more than 2,500 investment agreements that appear in their edit database. We observed three main forms, but they differed very little in a legal sense. They all recognised the importance of national policy measures that could be taken to protect health. I wanted to briefly highlight a couple of the diffusion networks that we observed, because this is something that we're looking more into at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, Germany is one of the countries with the most, uh, is the country with the most bits that mention health. And we saw that there was a really significant and very early appearance of the mentions of health in Germany's bits with uh, countries in the African region. And we thought this was partly interesting in terms of the different interests that are represented in terms of a, the interests of Germany in including health uh, with countries that are much less economically developed and um, like very unlikely to challenge uh, health measures just logistically in Germany. Um, but we also saw this as a real positive and potentially one of the contributors to the relatively significant proportion of um, 
bits signed by African countries that do include measures of health. We also saw that India was one of the leaders in including uh, in signing bits that included health in expropriation articles. Um, and it's one area where we'd like to do further research to understand some of the factors that drive this inclusion. Um, Canada is one of the global leads in signing bits that include general exceptions to health. And again, uh, it's possible that this also reflects previous experience with disputes. So finally, from a public health perspective, we can see that there's still quite significant potential for uh, bilateral investment treaties to include strong safeguards uh, for health measures that would prevent legitimate health measures from being contested. Uh, two of the key things we found interesting was this um, shift away from including health considerations in bits and then a shift back towards that. So we'd be interested in doing further some, re some further research to understand that better. Um, we also are interested in the geopolitical considerations. Most of the bits that include health are extra-regional bits uh, rather than intra-regional bits. And so we're interested in looking more at what fosters uh, innovation in consideration of health. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amari. Um, I, I mean, it, I, I was very much surprised by the, the result of, of Germany, not because I have any concern about Germany not fostering this type of provisions, but uh, um, I was wondering if, if you in included in, the, in, in, the, in your numbers also the agreements that concluded by the EU and, and through the EU also Germany, or just the EU, the Germany as, a, as an individual country? That's a good question. I need to go back and check. Um, but yeah. those were just those were that I presented were just Germany. So we mapped the EU agreement. Pro separately. Probably you will have yeah. But if you aggregate the information with the, with the EU, maybe the numbers will be higher for Germany even. Thank you again very much. We we have some time uh, left for questions. Uh, if you want to make questions, we, there is a a Q and A uh, section of the Zoom webpage. We already have a couple and. Um, so if you want to make a question, please use that, that, that forum. Uh, there is one question, an open question to, to all of you. Um, and I think I, I would rephrase it a little bit. This is uh, Bu Powell, he asked uh, that he will be very happy to hear our comments on the ongoing negotiations at the UNCITRAL about uh, the investment dispute reform. Um, I would, if I may, if I may rephrase it, uh, I think the general question would be, in my view, how having more access to information about investment treaties or the use of investment treaties as data can help in the process or in the discussion of investment reform uh, that is taking place at UNCITRAL and also elsewhere. Um, so I would like to pick your brain on this if you think it can be useful or, or not. And then we have a question for more uh, specifically, but let's open the floor with this one. Um, let's, let's do it in the, I, I would say in the, in the order of presentations, if you agree. What, what do you think, Wolfgang? Yeah, I think it's an, it's an excellent question, actually one that is already being debated because one of the big questions in, in the context of UNCITRAL is, is if we multilateralize aspects of in, in, uh, investor state dispute settlement, what are the elements that should be minimum standards that every state should agree on? And what are those elements that maybe states can opt into and opt out of? And edit actually prov provides a way to thinking about which types of ISDS features should uh, be put in one box as opposed to the other, because we can now map Con uh, convergence and consensus along issue areas, like Priyanka did uh, with respect to, to protection provisions, we can quantify what states have already agreed on in their past practice. And so there might be elements that actually most of the states have already agreed on, and that those elements could then be minimum standards that form part of this multilateral consensus. There might be other issue areas that are a little bit more controversial, and so those could be opt-in, opt-out mechanisms. So actually by looking at edit and its representation of existing practice, 
we can inform ways of how this can be consolidated or converged at the multilateral level through the UNCTRAL uh, deliberations. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Priyanka, what, what, what yeah. do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think as a data source, um, it's been an incredibly useful resource. And I think, Rodrigo, uh, we work together as well in a lot of our operational work with uh, client governments. I think one of our main observations staff observations is complete lack of information, awareness of what's been signed by prior governments, what's happened and what, what their treaty regime looks like. So I think just having uh, this wealth of information uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is hugely useful just in taking, making informed uh, decisions as, as Wolfgang was mentioning. Um, or from our perspective also, I think just increased visibility on um, some of the dimensions on dispute settlement has also helped us um, kind of um, um, make a much more targeted case for dispute prevention. I think we've, uh, we've been sort of uh, using and leveraging a lot of the information on, on edit and uh, other available resources to really uh, carve out a space for dispute prevention, taking into account some of the, you know, some of the aspects that others have discussed and other challenges around dispute settlement more broadly. So, uh, so very much see the value of this as just a huge information resource and, and a resource that builds, uh, bridges this data gap. Thank you very much, Priyanka. More, what are you, yeah. your two cents on this? Well, I don't have a, a lot to add to what Wolfgang and Priyanka said, just to further stress the utility of the, of the database to more systematically, efficiently, and easily uh, conduct research and to see what's, uh, what's the common practice. Um, because I think that it's so much more uh, comprehensive than other databases that we have. So, so it's really useful. Thank you very much, Moore. And Marie? Um, I agree. And I'd also add that for us, we're quite interested in thinking about the extent to which disputes have perhaps contributed to innovation in the health perspective. And so I think edit will be quite useful in that. And then potentially also generate useful information for reform by understanding the impact of um, disputes and yeah, so that's a separate piece of work to document where those have occurred. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. I mean, uh, I I think we, we we still have some some minutes for some questions. We have some individual uh, questions to all of you. So let me start by order of uh, of the questions. Uh, um, we have one question to more. Uh, Manfred Elsig says that it's an excellent work, and as asking if you will also focus in your work on the relationship between the degree of legalization and actual arbitration patterns, the usage. Do you expect differences uh, to other diets? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for this question. I think it's very interesting and I've been thinking about uh, these issues uh, myself. And I'm definitely, I want to, to, to have a look at the actual uh, arbitration patterns within uh, the Middle East and North Africa. And what I can say now, I mean, I haven't um, really plunged in yet uh, to that, but what I can say for now is that we can see that there is a gap between the inclusion of uh, Islamic forums and frameworks in uh, IIAs concluded uh, by Islamic law states particularly, and the actual um, well, in investors actually making use of such, uh, of such provisions. And that was true for, for, for decades. I mean, there haven't been much use. I mean, not many uh, investors from Islamic law states have referred uh, ISDS to, uh, to Islamic forums, but that's been changing in the last decade or so. Uh, we have about uh, 10 uh, cases uh, invoking uh, one uh, um, Islamic forum or, or another. So I think that's interesting to see why uh, states made a point of including these forums in their IAAs and why investors from this country uh, were for years reluctant to, to go there and why this, is, this reality is beginning to change uh, in recent years. Uh, so I'm definitely going to look uh, into that as part of uh, my PhD at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moore. Um, now I have a, a question directed to Wolfgang. Uh, Joram Haftel is asking if, if you have any idea why the British BITs are so popular. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating question. So I think there are three tentative explanations. There may be more. Uh, the first one is that 
The United K Kingdom joined the BITS universe relatively late. So in 1975, by that time, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Switzerland, they'd already started to sign BITS and they were trying to find their, their way towards a uh, more consistent BIT practice. While well, the United Kingdom benefited from all that experience and benefited from the work of the OECD that had published a, a draft convention in, 90, in 1980s, uh, 1967. And the United Kingdom was the country in, in the West that mostly emulated this OECD work. And so this combination of anchoring itself into this existing practice that, that had converged out of the OECD pro, uh, process and by benefiting from the experience of other states, maybe it produced a more mature model that could then be uh, uh, copied by others. The second uh, potential explanation is availability. So the United Kingdom notified and, and registered its treaties uh, with the UN and it was published in the United uh, Nations Treaty Series. And so it, it was just very, very available, whereas other treaty practices, uh, as, as we discovered also through this process, have been missing or are very difficult to, to get your hands on. So availability might be a second factor. The third factor, and that's maybe the most interesting one, at least to me, is style. So uh, at least for lawyer, if you read the, the United uh, Kingdom bits, they are very concisely written. They're very, they're just very, uh, well, it, it, you just have to, uh, you, you feel like you want to sign at the dotted line. They're, they're not as controversial. They're not as legalistic potentially as, as United States bilateral investment. They were longer from the start and seem to be more, more intrusive. So there might be something just in, way, in the way of it framing the obligations in a way that made them more appealing and therefore then more, uh, yeah, more ready to be adopted by other states. But again, this is research that should be, that, that, that should be undertaken. Maybe my last point is that the two research questions that I present may actually be linked because the Czech bits are much closer to the United Kingdom practice than the Polish bits. So the Czech Republic might have been more successful because it employed UK style language. So something to think about. Thank you very much, Wolfram. If I may add one thing is that all the other countries that Wolfram was referring to from, European, from Europe that they already had signed a lot of BITs, they didn't have all their treaties available in English. So Germany, a large number of treaties were just in German, French, uh, France just in French, and, and Switzerland, uh, if it was a, a, a French country that they were signing their agreement on, it was only in French too. Uh, so that could also be an explanation. Let's move to the next question for Priyanka this time, also from, from Joram Aftel. Uh, Joram is asking Priyanka, he didn't quite understand how you measure enforcement in the first paper. How do you combine it with investment rules? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And uh, it was the trickiest one. Pillow 4 was the trickiest one and which is, we actually did not quant quantitatively measure enforcement. We couldn't quantitatively me measure enforcement. This was the only pillar that was more of a qualitative assessment because as you can imagine, there's of course lack of data on enforcement of rules and regulations more broadly, but also on enforcement of awards. So what we relied on was essentially looking at some of the world governance indicators, uh, uh, which have, you know, which in some way are indicative of the level of legal enforcement in countries and are largely perception based. We also looked at ISDS data more broadly for some of these countries uh, to see, you know, what kinds of, uh, you know, what were the allegations in terms of, you know, uh, uh, in implementation of rules and what some of the outcomes were of ISDS uh, cases. Uh, we also looked at local disputes data uh, to get and local arbitration uh, results. Very difficult to find again. In some cases, we were able to find it. And in most cases, we weren't able to find it. So our approach on enforcement was really more of a case study approach where we uh, could get the richest data for Central Asian countries and a couple of other countries, which also had, uh, you know, disputes, ISDS, due to lack of enforcement of awards. So it was just much more richer data in that, in that sense. So, so tricky, I think enforcement and despite our best efforts, we follow through with ICSID as well to see if you know, there is a database of non-enforcement of awards or something similar. Uh, but no, there is really lacking uh, systematic data on enforcement. So that pillar uh, very much was qualitative assessment. Um, uh, and that's how it was, the narrative was developed around it. Thank you very much, Priyanka. Um, we have like four minutes left. So we have one question this time for Anne-Marie uh, from Professor Manfred Elsig too. 
um, he, he asked uh, if, did you find any patterns about the pathway of diffusion? Let's say Germany negotiates first with less powerful states to have a more accepted and supported VAT health model before negotiating with other large countries. Thank you, Professor Elsig. Uh, this is part of what we're hoping to do in this next phase of our study, um, to look also at the diffusion of specific clauses as well as um, the patterns of diffusion in terms of um, the power of states, language, and um, other dynamics. So um, we haven't yet, but we hope to. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. Um, I think that uh, we are almost at the time. So unless if there is any pressing question, I would like uh, first of all to thank our speakers today. Uh, it was really, really nice. I mean, you cannot imagine how, uh, um, I, I don't want to get emotional here, but how nice it is that, that uh, when the, the, the work we have been doing for years, you are able to use it to, to build something even more interesting. And, 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 and I mean, as a takeaway message from, from the development of this new database, I would say that we should leave the machines to do the boring work and, and let's be creative and, and use all this amount of data that, that is there. It was very difficult to work with in the first place to, 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 to come up with conclusions, with studies that require more the use of our brain than the use of our Excel uh, techniques or skills. Um, I would also like to, to thank particularly Manfred and, and Walton for, for all these years of work. I mean, the, the website is not is done, but there is a lot of work to do. We always find some bugs, something that is wrong, a treaty that it was, uh, uh, has some translation or, or OCR cleaning. So it's gonna be a, a, a long way to have a 100% uh, bulletproof uh, website, but it's, it's a work is in the making. We invite you to use the website, to notify any problem, to, to collaborate with us. As I mentioned, this is a, it's a, it's an open initiative. Anybody can get the data, anybody can use the data. And we want to actually to, to, to be able to, to share this data with, with all the people that are interested from, from law, from political science, from, from economy, economics, uh, government, and so on. So uh, once more, thank you very much to, to all our panelists. Thank you very much to the EUI and the WGI for organizing this session and inviting us. And uh, please use the database and give us your comments. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.